Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 68 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike, and that is Gavin, and that is Fia. I still have to get the uh, kind of the cadence of the intro down with the third person, yeah. but I think... Yeah. I th- yeah, I... Oof. I mean, should we re-record this one or just roll with it? Nah, we're going with it. We're going with it? Well, how are you guys? It's wonderful to talk <laughs> to you both. I'm doing pretty good. Um, I'm back out in the desert. It was 96 degrees today. It was... Uh... Whoa. It sure was a day. Um, mm-hmm. That's that's how my day was. How about you, Fia? How are you doing? I'm doing good, yeah. Uh, I took a day off of caffeine today and fully realized that I am completely dependent on caffeine. <laughs> so I, I could never. Like. <laughs> yep. It was tough. Whereas I've, I've never had a cup of coffee in my life, so nice. I'm just li- living life, you know, free from those chains. Stay away. It's it's not yeah. it's not good. <laughs> yep. But uh, yeah, today's episode is going to be an interesting one because I had looked back at all of our episodes, you know, sixty eight episodes in, and I thought to myself, "Hey, we've never done an episode about invertebrates before, and we just so happened to add a new host who works with invertebrates." <laughs> So I thought this might be a good time. Yeah, sounds good. So we're going to be talking about a really interesting group of invertebrates that is one of the most important groups of fossil animals that is surprisingly still alive. Uh, This was a group that I learned almost everything that I know about them from the fossils before I even learned that some of them are still around today. So Whoa. that's how much better known they are as fossils than they are as like the actual living animals. Um, so the group would be the brachiopods, a group that looks very suspiciously like clams, which we'll talk about a lot today, but are not clams. Uh, but before we get into that, Mike, do you have some history for us? Yeah, it's a mystery. This is um, a little different than um, kind of our usual political kind of history. Um, but today in 1973, the Pittsburgh Pirates retired um, Roberto Clemente's number 21. Mm-hmm. Now, are either of mm-hmm. you guys familiar with Roberto Clemente? No. Vaguely? Yeah, so um, Roberto Clemente was a baseball player, but he was uh, much, much more than that. And so he was a um, – oh, goodness, I want to make sure I get this right. Yes, he was a uh, he was a Puerto Rican-born baseball player who played with the Pittsburgh Pirates, and that's not really why he was famous. Um, he was – a Hall of Fame level baseball player. Um, But he was also just one of the great humanitarians um, of the time. And actually, Mm -hmm. um, sort of tragically, he gets his 3,000th hit. So he has exactly 3,000 hits. Um, That offseason in 1972, there was, I believe, an earthquake in Nicaragua or something. He was Mm -hmm. arranging aid and getting ready to have supplies. And um, while that was happening, on one of the planes he was on, there was something went wrong and there was a plane crash. And and unfortunately, Clemente died, um, wow. which, right. And so, you know, it is, it is kind of one of those things where the, the thing that he was best known for being a baseball player is probably not even the thing he did best. He was one of uh, the great humanitarians. And there's been a number of calls throughout baseball, actually, to retire his number 21 throughout baseball, just like uh, Jackie Robinson's number 42 mm-hmm. is retired. Because um, he is, you know, just, again, one of the all-time great humans to have, uh, to have walked the earth. And so, yeah, today in 19, oh, what was it? 1973. So the year after he died, the Pittsburgh Pirates retired his number 21 and uh, good on them for doing it so shortly thereafter. So let, let me ask wow. you a question, Mike. So, yeah. And I don't remember if you said this, you, you might have, but he was a pitcher, right? He was a right fielder, actually. Oh, okay. I don't know who I'm thinking of that was a pitcher, but I was, that makes much more sense because I was like, 3,000 hits for a pitcher seems like <laughs> no, un- ungodly crazy. good. Yeah. Yes, that would be. And I'm like, man, this nuts. guy was awesome. Um, <laughs> but okay, no, that makes much more sense. Yep. No, he, he's again, it's one of those things. He's one of the greatest, you know, players of all time. Again, he had 3,000 hits. He had one of the greatest throwing arms from right field um, that you'll ever see. And there's some videos of that. And again, you know, that's, I wouldn't bring mm-hmm. him up if he was just a very good baseball player. Right. Um, you know, he did, he did so much other work. Um, you know, for for his community and you know various other communities that he deserves a mention whenever you get a shot. And uh, today is as good as any. Yeah, I I don't remember what the context was, but I don't know if like 
our library in school had like a children's book about him maybe uh that i mean a hundred percent probably one of those like who was R- roberto clemente or something to that something like books. that yeah yeah um i would i would 100 percent believe that and you know he i believe i've seen that book around um you know because it's similar to jackie robinson like jackie robinson was a hall of fame level baseball player and you know he's more famous for you know for many other things mm-hmm. you know clemente is you know clemente kind of falls into that category of people that are famous for you know for just being like a good dude um mm-hmm in so many different respects. So yeah, Roberto Clemente is our uh, today in history. Today is when the cool. Pittsburgh Pirates retired his number. So Gavin, you said something about uh, invertebrates today? Yeah, so we're going to be talking about a phylum, an entire phylum of life called the brachiopods. So I'll break down a little bit more about what exactly they are and what they do and why they are so famous. Um, but first, just as a reference for what we're going to be talking about, just as, as sort of the the starting point. We're going to talk to Fia and have Fia sort of explain us what bivalves do in their environment, because A, that's the group that Fia mainly works with. Yep. And B, brachiopods are sure are similar. Um, so gotcha. most people know bivalves as clams there are others there's a difference so i'm told um but we'll we'll let fia explain it go ahead yeah so uh i as you know work with bivalves one of those being uh oysters uh the literal meaning of bivalves is being or having a shell composed of two valves so uh two shells um and some other examples are oysters, clams, mussels, scallops, and majority are filter feeders. Some um, ecological impacts that bivalves do uh, include um, impacting nutrient cycle, cycling, um, stabilizing sediments, um, kind of calming or attenuating wave energy. They also just filter a crap ton of water. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and they can also create or modify habitat, which is specifically what I work with with oysters because they form reefs and have mm. positive effects on the food web by being prey or indirectly by moving nutrients and energy and overall can do a lot of good or a lot of bad <laughs> if they are lacking. <laughs> yeah, or even if there's too many of them. I know the Great Lakes right. area where I grew up is just inundated with zebra mussels. Right, right. That are not that are not native to there and they just are start a little too good at what they do. Yeah. Uh, and just really choke off like the life of, you know, a lot of other groups of animals that should normally be there. Um Yeah. But yeah, so That's if true. you were if you were to describe everything that a bivalve does, but nothing about the inside parts of it, you would get a brachiopod. Brachiopods are shockingly similar to bivalves, considering they're not all that closely related. So brachiopods are basically, if you, let's say if clams and other bivalves are what you would find on like, Amazon brachiopods are like the knockoff version you'd find on eBay. <laughs> nice. Wish.com. That's a, that, oh, that's such a better one. <laughs> oh, that's so much better. Yeah. Good one. <laughs> um, but yeah, so brachiopods, unlike other, um, I guess backing up a little bit. So unlike with vertebrates, most people are generally familiar with vertebrates. They're very charismatic. They're like us. So when we learn about ourselves or even most people's favorite animals, I feel like very few people would list a non-vertebrate. If you were to just go up to somebody on the street and ask them their favorite animal, most people are pretty familiar with the general groups of vertebrates, not as much with invertebrates. So we have to do a little bit of higher level taxonomy here to really figure out exactly where these things are and what they're related to. So, 
Uh, brachiopods are bilaterians, members of the group bilateria. What which does basically, that even mean? It basically means if you were to cut them down the middle, the right half and the left half would be basically symmetrical. I mean, would humans be bilaterians? Yes. Okay. Basically, the only things that are not bilaterians are sponges and uh, cnidarians, things like your so corals, jellyfish, sea anemones. So this must be like pretty high up on the... Yes. Um, this the, this okay. is between kingdom and phylum. Gotcha. So that's okay. why we've, we've talked at length about how the, the kingdom phylum class order family genus species does not include nearly everything. Right. And so between kingdom and phylum, we have even lots and lots and lots of other groups as well. So um, they are bilaterian. So if you're to cut them in half, their right and left would be basically the same. And they okay. are also members of the group protostomia or protostomes. And so what that means, that's a, a developmental thing. So when after the egg is fertilized, when the embryo starts to develop, there are two big groups. There are the deuterostomes, okay, deutero. which uh, <laughs> develop the anus first. <laughs> okay. And there are the protostomes, keep going, keep going. Go, go, which go, develop go. the mouth first. Which might seem like, eh, who cares? But it's actually a very important embryological distinction. So deuterostomes are uh, echinoderms, things like your starfish. Uh, sea urchins and such, and also vertebrates, you and me. So, um, and all of our, you know, close relatives. So those develop anus first. Protostomes, which is basically everything else, basically all of your invertebrates that are not starfish and, and their cousins are protostomes. So they develop mouth first. So that basically includes everything from arthropods, insects, crabs, and such, uh, mollusks, things like your cephalopods, bivalves, snails, and slugs, uh, and also things like brachiopods. And within that, we get to the super phylum, lophophorata, which is animals with a lophophore, which is a feeding structure. And I want to reiterate a little bit on how bivalves feed, because this is the first big distinction between brachiopods and bivalves. So, Fia, run, run us back. How do bivalves, like, actually feed? Because it's not like they're, you know, swimming around, yeah. s scooping stuff up into their shell, you know? Yep, yep, yep. So, um, bivalves are majority uh, sedentary filter feeders. So, basically, they just pass water through their insides. Uh, they have gills on the inside, um, but not, like, typical, like, fish gills. Mm -hmm. Um and they basically suck in water through their insides and pull out suspended food particles like algae or just organic matter. And that's like mixed up in the water. Cool. So that's more or less, that, that's the simple way to do it, more or less, is that they happen to be just moving water in anyway because they, they need it to breathe. And then they right. have... Um, I believe they do they use their gills to, to separate the water and the food as well? Uh, yes, I do believe so. Okay. So in things with a lophophore, which includes brachiopods, the lophophore is a dedicated structure, a, a skeletal feature um, that is typically a spiraled ring of little tentacles that they use to collect food. They, they same reason that you know bivalves do, they bring it in because they need water to breathe. And they, instead of just using their gills to do it, or uh, I don't even, I don't believe brachiopods even have dedicated gills. I think it's mostly just osmosis, how they get a lot of their oxygen. Um, mm -hmm. But they have this dedicated feeding structure that has these little tiny tentacles that will just filter out little food particles from the water. So that is a defining characteristic of this group, which includes brachiopods, as well as bryozoans. Bryozoans... Mm -hmm are another phylum of uh, uh, animals that we've talked about before, um, very briefly, but they uh, are often called like sea fans. They look similar to corals externally. They make sort of a hard skeletal structure that looks like a very flat sort of fan that you might see on a reef. 
uh, those are bryozoans. And they're typically yeah. considered the closest cousin to brachiopods. And that gets us to the phylum brachiopoda, which literally means arm foot. For a reason I'll explain <laughs> later, uh, even though they have neither arms nor feet. Uh, so brachiopods, like I said, superficially and ecologically very, very similar to bivalves. But, and Fia, correct me if I'm wrong, bivalves typically have left and right halves, right, for their shells. That's yeah. typically how you refer to them. So brachiopods yep. have a top and bottom instead. So if you were to be looking at just a single shell from a clam, if you were to try to cut it left to right, that would not be symmetrical because that would be the equivalent of cutting you basically across your abdomen instead of from your head down. That's why clam shells are not symmetrical because you're looking at the wrong side. Um, but by, but uh, brachiopods, when you cut them sort of in half, it looks the same, uh, right half, left half, because you're actually cutting it from the human equivalent of like the head down, if that makes sense. Now, Gavin, I have a question yeah. about this. Does this include their internal organs too? About their Loosely, symmetry? yes. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, and obviously, you know, even within humans, it's a little bit different. Like your heart isn't exactly in the middle of your chest. Right. So even though we are bilaterally symmet uh, symmetrical, it, it's not perfect, especially when all the soft tissue stuff gets in there because you move that around as needed. Yep. Um, but yeah, so that's that's the biggest thing. And with clam shells or other bivalve shells, the, the two shells are basically the same. There's a little bit of difference in like around the hinge where they have to connect to each other. Um, but they're more or less the same. Is that pretty much right? Yeah. With brachiopods, that is not at all the case. The top shell and bottom shell look very different. Uh, one, the the top shell uh, typically has a little hole in it, depending on what group of them you're looking at, um, that has a structure that comes out of it, a fleshy structure uh, called the pedicel that uh, is similar, if, if very different, but functions a little similarly to like a clam's foot. So it's a, it's a, that, that's just what it's called. It's not like actual little walking feet. It's just like a muscular, it's basically just like a big muscle that they use to dig around and stuff. Um, yeah. so, um, if you've ever seen, um, what are they called? Like the big like ob obscenely big clams with the like or, giant or like, clams. No, I think they're all like gooey ducks, but it's spelled like, it's not at all spelled <laughs> that way, but it's like well, the, the foot is like four times the size of the, the shell. I got to look this up. Pacific gooey duck. Oh boy. Oh, right. It's, it's, it's spelled that, like that... geoduck. Oh, yeah. I that, that, <laughs> that structure I'm, I'm pretty sure is the foot. Yeah. It looks like a different kind of structure, but okay. It it sure does. Um, but that's not the topic <laughs> of today's episode. So um, bivalves use, at least the ones that move through through the sediment, which I believe are mostly just clams, um, uh, use that as their way to move around. Uh, brachiopods instead have uh, what's called a pedicel, which varies from group to group, but mostly it's just like a little stalk that uh, I think only one group of them really uses it to move around all that much, but instead they sort of use it to lift themselves up off the sediment so they're not just sitting on the floor. A lot of them don't sit on the floor like you would think of with like a giant clam, how that just sort of sits with its you know shell open and filters and stuff. Uh, but brachiopods will actually hold themselves up off of the sediment. Um, and there's a number of reasons to want to do that. Uh, air or Water flow might be a little bit better you, you can move yourself up and down depending on, uh, you know, water conditions, predator conditions, things like that. And that actually comes through a little hole basically at the back of the top half. Um, and that, again, that varies from group to group. Some groups have a hole, some groups don't. The bottom shell is wildly variable. In some, it looks like a big bowl. And others, it just sort of sits underneath the top shell like a 
like a jaw, almost like your own jaw, how it's sort of got an underbite or an overbite. Sometimes they can overhang the top shell. Sometimes they underhang it. And it's, it's just kind of a mess, honestly, <laughs> when you're trying to figure out how the shells fit together because they don't fit together usually as nicely as bivalve shells do. And another big difference between the two of them is what they make their shells out of between brachiopods and bivalves. So bivalves tend to make their shells from mostly calcite, but also aragonite, which is chemically the same, but structurally how the atoms arrange themselves is a little bit different, makes it a little less stable, but it's easier to make. So a lot of bivalves will make it out of that instead. Um, there are some brachiopods that do it that way, but that's not all of them. Some of them make it out of a completely different mineral called apatite, uh, which oh. is more or less what your teeth are made out of, which was weird. That's yeah. Um, which is uh, calcium phosphate as opposed to the calcium carbonate that uh, bivalves used to make their shells and what most things use to make their shells. Um, and then something that I had oh, anything. Oh, sorry. No, do you know if this had anything to do with, like, the availability of, like, minerals at the time? Like, was there just, like, more, uh, like, availability of calcium uh, phosphate? I don't think so. I think it probably just happened to... We'll talk about their evolution here in a little bit. I think it just okay. depended on the chemical pathway that what they evolved from used. Oh, okay. Cool. Um. And, and that will make more sense in a little bit because we're going to talk about their evolution and also talk about them sort of – so right now we're comparing like their anatomy to bivalves just because they are super, super similar. Like especially around where I was in, uh, in South Dakota when I worked at the museum up there, a lot of the marine rocks are old, uh, older than when bivalves were more common than brachiopods. So people would bring us in brachiopods thinking that they were bivalves. Um, hmm. because if, if you don't know any better, it's very easy to confuse the two, but, um, right. Yeah. So, uh, they, they make their shells differently and they also fit themselves in the shells differently because brachiopods, some of them have tubes throughout the shell where they have some of their tissues and they can have up to half of like the living tissue of the animal, like not just like inside the cups of the shell, but like within the structure of the cell, that would basically be like 50% of your weight living inside your bones. Well, I mean, I assume that's rather unusual for animals that have shells. Yes. That's very unusual. Uh, bivalves do not do that. Um, I don't really think there's like, like no mollusks do that, you know? So no, like other, uh, like gastropods, things like snails don't do that. Um, I don't believe yeah. any of the um, shelled cephalopods did that. Things like ammonites, things like that. I don't believe any of them did it in the same way. Um, and th that's just, and, and the reason I'm saying all of this is to just say convergent evolution is really cool mm -hmm. <laughs> because they look so similar to, to somebody again, who, who isn't, you know, trained to know these things. Um, they look so similar. They do very similar things in their environment, but just do them in very weird, almost like Lovecraftian sort of ways. Like if a clam were to like bump up on a brachiopod, it would like probably freak out and be like, why do you do things that way? Why do you have these <laughs> tentacles? What are you doing? Uh, why do you hold yourself off the sediment like a weirdo? Um, so... That is clams versus brachiopods in terms of sort of their anatomy. So let's talk about some of their history. Because like I said, this is a very classic, you know, very important group fossil-wise. So as with a lot of shelly organisms, they first show up in the Cambrian period uh, around 541 million years ago. So long time. And... They likely evolved from some kind of slug-like organism in the Ediacaran, which is the period beforehand, and started producing shells early on in the Cambrian, like pretty much everything else did. Um, the first time we see like actual real animal uh, biomineralization. 
So like animals incorporating minerals into their structure to give themselves support and things uh, really happens in the Cambrian period. And so the Cambrian period, uh, I don't need, I need to get better at remembering what episode numbers go with what. Um, <laughs> but the Cambrian period, if you remember back to any of the multiple times we've talked about the geologic record, is the first period of the Paleozoic era. So the first main important era of animal multicellular life. And so brachiopods are one of the first recognizable groups to show up within that. So this is very classically one of the oldest represented groups in the fossil record. So there is a phylum of animals called horseshoe worms that are still around today that also appear around the same time that appear genetically kind of close. And that's one of the nice things about brachiopods is that they're still around. So we can actually do DNA stuff on them, which we'll, we'll come back to later. Um, but yeah, they, they genetically appear to be fairly closely related to brachiopods and it sort of based on their fossils look like they had shell like structures at the front and back that may have evolved into sort of the top and bottom shells of uh, of brachiopods that's what the consensus was for a little bit uh you know for a decent chunk of the 1900s once we started doing some genetics things but the embryology stuff doesn't quite add up i don't know enough about embryology to actually understand how that works i think they just develop differently as embryos but uh instead they appear to be similar to uh, an extinct fossil group called the Tomatidia, I believe that's how you say that word, <laughs> that basically had a, instead of having like one shelly part at the front and one shelly part at the back, they appeared to have two separate shelly parts at the back that then eventually became the top shell, bottom shell, as they sort of evolutionarily sort of curled within it to then close, if that sort of makes sense. And they, they, the, the shelly structures look superficially kind of similar to uh, brachiopod shells and were mineralized, importantly, like like uh, early brachiopods with that weird uh, calcium phosphate uh, substance, unlike pretty much anything else that makes their shells. Hmm. And if you look at pretty much anything about brachiopods, you'll see them divided into two main groups called the articulates and the inarticulates, basically just how they connect the top and bottom shells to each other. Uh, the articulates have like little teeth structures that slot into each other, and that's how they hinge with one another. And the inarticulates don't. They just use muscles to keep themselves lined up correctly. And basically, since the group was first described in detail in 1869... Nice. Um, uh, that, that was basically how they were sort of described. Um, and that sort of ended up changing somewhere in the 1990s. So for, you know, 120 years, that was the, pretty much how stuff was going with them. And uh, around that time, they started actually doing some genetic stuff on them. Like I said, it's, it's very rare that we're able to do this kind of thing. Because for the most part, all the cool early branching off groups of animals are gone. But brachiopods are very stubborn. They don't want to die. Uh, <laughs> and we'll, they came real close, and we'll talk about that. But uh, they're, they're very persistent. And so once we started doing some genetic stuff on them, uh, it, it very much confused things. So... Uh, the when you look at sort of their genetics and their morphology as well as how they make their shells instead of having the two groups the articulates and the inarticulates it basically suggested two separate three-part systems each of which may be correct uh that's that's you know that's taxonomy um yep. so basically the ones with the calcium phosphate shells in one group uh, there's some inarticulates, so the ones that don't have the, that don't slot their shells together. Uh, some of them make their shells out of calcite, so they're in a separate group. And then the articulates that also use calcite are in 
a third separate group. That's pretty much the consensus that I have sort of seen. Not that it's particularly important, but the, even with genetics, things don't always get easier. DNA is doesn't really thing, tell you everything. Is this the kind of thing where humans are just kind of drawing lines because it's convenient, or is there like pretty obviously three groups? Um, I don't know enough about the inarticulate ones that use calcite to say that. But almost certainly with everything with taxonomy, that's it's just humans trying to make it easy for ourselves to talk about them. Okay. Because uh, they're, the genetics for this group are very weird from what I've gathered. Basically, there are some things that do not look at all like brachiopods that, based on genetics, should be included in brachiopods. Or the inarticulate ones that use the calcium phosphate like weirdos should be something different, should not be considered brachiopods. Uh, that's all based on genetics. I don't know. I don't think that that's a popular way to talk about it. I don't think that's very well, like supported by paleontologists who study them. Uh, but there's just a lot of weird stuff. DNA is always sort of portrayed as like the sort of silver bullet. Where it's like, oh, you just, you know, do a DNA test, see which ones are more similar to each other. And that's not how it works. Um, <laughs> I really, I really wish that it was, but right. I, especially when you're talking about groups that separated half a billion years ago or more, you know? I mean, because at that point, you know, this was sort of part of the deal with Jurassic Park. Like, we don't really have great DNA from, you know, animals that went extinct that long ago, right? For them, no, but with, with the living groups of brachiopods. So today we have the, we have a bunch of oh, living you using ones living today to, yes. okay, I see what you yeah. mean. Yeah. So we have living articulates and inarticulates. So the two very wide separate parts of brachiopods. So even just comparing their genetics to each other, let alone any other type of animal, um, just those two separate sides of brachiopods split like evolutionarily at least in the early cambrian so 530 ish million years ago or so like at least that far apart um so while they're considered a lot in the same group that is farther related or you know obviously much much more distantly time-wise related than we are to any other vertebrate you know us and turtles are more closely related genetically, prob well, probably genetically, but um, taxonomically for sure than that. And taxonomy is weird. <laughs> Genetics is weird. Science in general is just real weird, but uh, <laughs> I mean, you remember sure the title of the first episode of this podcast. Yeah, you know, yeah that's what I was, <laughs> that's just what I was going to bring up. <laughs> um, but yeah, brachiopods. Um, so regardless of how they're all, the groups are related to each other, they are ecologically a very important part of the Paleozoic faunas. Basically, any kind of marine environment that you find, you find brachiopods during the Paleozoic. So the Paleozoic lasted from 541 uh, million years to 252 million years. So uh, a very long stretch of time, almost 300 million years. Mm. And uh, that entire time, Brachiopods are, well, with a couple of notable exceptions, uh, brachiopods are just living great. They are, every marine ecosystem for that, that entire 300 million years, they are crushing it. They are becoming ex very diverse. There are over 12,000 fossil species known, which for vertebrates, I kind of doubt we have that many just vertebrates. Yeah. And uh, they, they filled basically every niche that you can think of, including a lot of things that you classically think of bivalves doing today, things like scallops that are known for like their sort of swimming ability. There were brachiopods that were pretty sure did that. Um, there are some that dig. Not, not as many, um, but lots and lots of bivalves do that today, dig within the sediment and live inside the sediment. There are some that do that, but that's not as much of a thing for brachiopods. 
um, and, and even doing things like reef building, like uh, like a lot of oysters do today and lots of other, there were several groups of clams that did that um, throughout, mostly like the Cretaceous and the Jurassic did that as well. Mm-hmm. And um, some were like sort of cementing, so they would just land on, you know, some other hard structure and glue their shells to it, like uh, like a lot of oysters do. But most of them did just sort of do exactly what you sort of think of. They sit on their bottom shell on the seafloor and just sit and filter. Um, and for most of the Paleozoic, where it was fairly warm and lots and lots of shallow seas, they were just living their best life. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, any info about fresh water in terms of this? So I looked into that. Because I found one source that said maybe, but everything else was like brackish water at most. So brackish, gotcha. you know, f- for listeners, brackish meaning like where a river would empty into the ocean, where it's like less salty than the ocean, but definitely not fresh water either. Um, yeah. So that was something that I like looked into because I'm like, well, they did all these other things that bivalves seem to do and bivalves sure seem to do great in in fresh water but yeah brachiopods really just didn't really ever seem to get there nice. which, which was strange to me because and then i also got thinking like well how did bivalves get there so it's not like they swim most of them yeah and i'm like well rivers well, only rivers only flow one way um their larvae is like transferred through current so that might be okay We'll save that for a future bivalves episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the big reason that brachiopods are so important, their their diversity, their abundance. So it's not just like they're very diverse, but there's a few of them. It's like, no, they're very diverse and there's thousands of each of each of the species that occur in any given environment. And because of that, be, they become very useful to use for long-term diversity trend studies, including things like extinctions. Three out of the five big five mass extinctions happen in the Paleozoic era, when brachiopods were at their heyday. And mass extinctions just in general, as something that occurs, was actually first noticed using fossils of marine invertebrates, because their sample size is way better than anything terrestrial or vertebrate just because you know if you have a better sample size you can see patterns in your data better and we've talked about that several times right and so a large part of this good sample size of paleozoic invertebrates is brachiopods and so brachiopods became very very important environmental indicators and indicators of extinctions and so a lot of the a lot of what we understand about mass extinctions is owed to our knowledge of brachiopods. So let's walk through those extinctions because it's weird and not each of the extinctions with brachiopods is particularly well understood, but I couldn't really find much of a pattern when looking at you know, zooming out, looking at all the extinctions. So the first mass extinction, the end or division episode 59, um, one third of all brachiopod families go extinct. So a third of all families going extinct, that's a lot. That's, I I looked and I could not find a good source for how many, like what percentage of species went extinct. But if a third of your families go extinct, that's a lot of species. Um, There's got to be some sort of like tipping point in there where if, Oh, we will get percentage. Oh well, then never mind. Right, we will we will get there. I will shut my mouth. We we sure will. The late Devonian, the 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 second of the big five quote unquote mass extinctions in the late Devonian period, I couldn't find an actual like dedicated number for how well they did. But in general, everything I saw was like, yeah, they didn't do great. You know, maybe <laughs> maybe, maybe not a third of all families bad, but generally, you know, it's, it's a mass extinction. Uh, generally probably over 50% of species going extinct. Then there's the end Permian mass extinction, uh, which we've talked about in passing several times as the great dying 
mass extinction, where conservatively, 95% of all brachiopod species go extinct. That's not good. Basically all of them. And that is the real sort of tipping point that I think you were going to ask about. Because up till this point, like I said, brachiopods are living their best life throughout all the Paleozoic. Even though they did pretty bad in the first two mass extinctions, they still recovered pretty well. And then the Antipermian mass extinction happens, and they just they just didn't. It, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I was going for. Yeah. I was thinking about even more just like at some point, so many of them died that just the rest, like at some point there's a tipping point where... Once you get over a certain percentage, you'll get to 100%. I guess that's not quite true. Um, or you have to get pretty damn close to 99% before that'll happen. But, I mean, this is you know sort of that next order of magnitude where, you know, once 95% right. of them go out, you know, it's kind of hard to come back from that. Right. And I, I want to keep in mind a sort of perspective here. Uh, this is an entire phylum that we're talking about here. So this would right. be all vertebrates well i guess vertebrates isn't that's not even a a full phylum all chordates which includes several other groups that are not the bony vertebrates that you're thinking of but are technically in the same phylum but um yeah 95 of all of them going extinct would basically just leave us with like fish and a couple species of birds that's pretty much it so um After that, there are still two more mass extinctions, and from what I can tell, brachiopods seem to do pretty much fine for the other two. (laughs) So that would be the end Triassic mass extinction and the end Cretaceous, the one that uh, took out the non-bird dinosaurs. And through through, there's a reason they did so well. Like, is this is this like survivorship bias? Is this you know? I think that might be it. Okay. Yeah, I really think that might be it. Just because, as I'll talk about, there's they just didn't really recover very well from the end Permian. And so it's like their fossil record isn't great. Like we still have fossils after the end Permian mass extinction, but Mm -hmm. their fossil record after that just is not as good. So it's like, well, I think the, the lineages that survived the end Permian were probably like the ones that were really good at living in conditions that are not good for anybody else. Really low oxygen, really low nutrients. Um, So it's like, well, if we weeded out all the weaklings, we only have the hardcore doomsday preppers left. Uh, So (laughs) the remaining two mass extinctions probably just, you know, might not have been as big of a deal for them because of that. Um, And just because you know, say 95% of all species of brachiopods go extinct in the end Permian, that doesn't mean that those 5% that are left don't actually do better. That's something that you see. They're called disaster taxa. Basically organisms <laughs> that... Disaster taxa? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it's it's organisms that while everybody else is having a real hard time <laughs> during a mass extinction, they, for whatever reason, whether they just happen to be you know, require less oxygen in the water because mass extinctions frequently uh, are associated with uh, anoxic events in the ocean when ocean just gets depleted in oxygen for uh, various chemical reasons. So it's like if you need less oxygen than your neighbor, you can take over your neighbor's spot because they're dead now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you'll that's very common for brachiopods to do in the mass extinctions where it's like, yeah, all of them, but these couple weirdos are doing horrible. But those weirdos, they're doing amazing. Uh, so that might have just also been... a big problem. Yeah. Uh, anoxia is also a big problem in the coast of Louisiana, too, in the Gulf of Mexico. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, a big, a big part of, especially what causes like shallow ocean anoxia is too many nutrients in the water. Yeah. And we get all the nutrients. <laughs> Yeah, with the Mississippi and how big that drainage basin is and how much fertilizer we use, uh, all of that goes down into the Gulf and just chokes everything in the Gulf. Yeah. Jeez. Yep. Um, And so after the end Permian, they do okay with the following two mass extinctions, but they never 
get to the levels of diversity that they saw like right before the end of Permian. So now I want to bring back sort of brachiopods versus bivalves because for a long time it was kind of thought that brachiopods didn't recover very well after the end Permian because uh, bivalves started to do really well. And like I said, they do ecologically very similar things. So it was sort of the thought that bivalves outcompeted the uh, brachiopods and sort of took their spot, which as we now have learned, you know, decades later, that's not really how evolution and extinction kind of works. Um, that's only a part of the case. So a couple people in uh, the 80s did like long term, um, you know, deep time studies and basically showed that bivalves, you know, they show up in the fossil record about the same time as brachiopods did. And both groups increase in diversity the entire time throughout the Paleozoic. So before the end Permian mass extinction, both of them are increasing. So it's not like the brachiopods were keeping the bivalves down or something because they got a head start and took all the, the niches. That's not really how it happened. Bivalves were doing perfectly fine. There just weren't as many of them. Um, but the end Permian, for whatever reason, I, th- I think it basically just came down to brachiopods getting hit by the end Permian worse than bivalves did. And like the end Permian also affected bivalves, but it only Thanos snapped them by like about 50%, you know? So like 50% of your diversity loss is still a lot, but it's not 95%. Right. So I think like, like you were saying, it's just really hard to recover from a 95% loss. And so they, that's probably why bivalves are as successful and diverse as they are today is that for whatever chemical reason or ecological reason, bivalves did better through the end Permian, had a better head start going on afterward. So that is pretty much all I've got for brachiopods. I definitely have done them a disservice. This is, like I said, an incredibly important, uh, very large, like I said, 12,000 fossil species. Uh, I didn't even barely talk about any of the living species. I think there's around 300 of them. Um, Is this something where they're located everywhere or are they located kind of concentrated in one area? uh, They're located in more places than I thought they would be. Uh, Generally, they're pretty restricted to uh, deep water, pretty cold environments. They're very common in like the Northern Pacific. Okay. Um, But they're also found, I think, in the, in the Southern Ocean, more toward Antarctica as well. I I don't know how many of them. uh, (laughs) Yeah. Life living at a hotel, you know? Um, But yeah, I don't think there's too many known from tropical reasons, regions these days that they absolutely used to be, you know, they were like the, you know, reef adjacent animals throughout pretty much all of the time they've been alive. Um, but it's not today. So that's Brachiopods. Right. And well, with that. Thank you for that. Yeah. Fia, I believe, uh, I believe you're up with some Swamp Corner. Yes. So uh, for this Swamp Corner uh, section, I wanted to share something interesting that I learned at a meeting that I went to this past week with a bunch of wildlife researchers with Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries and uh, USGS, which is United States Geological Surveys, right? Yep, sure is. Yep. So uh, this fun fact that I learned is about how two non-game fish are declining in Louisiana and kind of the Gulf of Mexico by two different mechanisms. Non-game fish, uh, meaning not like prize winning, like you go out and go fishing for these. They're kind of just like, they don't really have any commercial value, but you end up catching them if you go fishing gotcha. and stuff like that. So uh, preface of that, um, some huge issues that Louisiana's coast is facing right now. Um, some of those issues are marshland loss, which is just self-explanatory, the loss of marshland and uh, the kind of channels and waterways that go in uh, between those land 
pieces, also climate change, which uh, mm -hmm. he around here we see increases in average temperatures and also increased storm events. So um, with that, we have the first uh, species that I want to talk about, which is the speckled or spotted sea trout. Um, scientific name, sorry if I butcher it, but Cynocean <laughs> nebulosis. Um, this is a, a common non-game fish caught off the channels and shores of Louisiana. And their populations are thought to be declining right now because of habitat loss, which um, is going to be the marshland um, and the channels. They use that area for spawning and uh, to deposit their larvae and um, where the juvenile fish will kind of hide and use as like um, protection from predators. So uh, the erosion of these uh, marshlands and complex channels and marsh mazes, if you will, are causing less ideal uh, conditions for these events to occur and therefore could potentially decrease the populations. And then the other uh, species is the southern flounder, a uh, scientific name, Paralethus lethostigma. Um, Side note, another... flounder is just one of my favorite names for anything. I don't know why oh, exactly so cool. I find it funny. I, need, I don't yeah. know anything about a flounder. I couldn't pick a flounder out of a police lineup, but yeah. like, I just love the name flounder. So have you ever seen those fish that are like flat? And uh, only have one eyeball and lay like on the bottom of yeah. like the floor. Yeah, that's so. that's what a southern flounder is. It's like okay. that weird looking fish that's like kind of just like laying laying on the floor. It's like super flat and it's got this one eye poking out. Or it looks like the beta version of a fish. Like I hadn't quite gotten it down. Yet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Ev yeah. evolution hadn't version, quite perfected like, it. Yeah, like zero point one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. I give it like so, zero point six. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, their populations are thought to be declining because of the um, increase in um, average temperatures around this area. The weird thing about these uh, southern flounder is that they're temperature dependent sex determination. So um, mm. in ideal situations, um, when the southern flounder gets to a specific point in their life, if it's 18 degrees Celsius or 28 degrees Celsius, um, in 18 or lower and then 28 or higher, you'll see that the southern flounders will um, change their sex to males. Whereas in somewhere like in between around 23 degrees Celsius, is the op optimal temperature for where the females develop. So if it's too high or too low, you get like a crap ton of males. And it's really specific about the um, temperature for where females get, um, like, I guess the females transform their sex. So is it that, um, do you say like the females will become males or, or so was it just I'm more males really are born? Yeah, I w I'm not really sure about what happens like beforehand if they're just like if they don't have a sex until they reach this certain like development in mm -hmm. their life or if they are already males and then will switch to females. But I think it's I think it's the first one where they're not they don't have a sex and then like depending on this temperature they will mm -hmm. either be male or female. And yeah, once they I, get to that point, then they are like, that's what they are at that point. There is no yeah. further you know, transition right. for lack of a better word. Yep. Um, yep. So I know that there are a lot of species that actually do this and their genetics kind of freak me out. Um, but for, <laughs> yeah, for a lot of animals, it's so all vertebrates are basically inherently female. But uh, if at least it, the way most people understand it in mammals, um, the Y chromosome basically just provides a hormone at a certain developmental point that then triggers the changes to become male. Um, in uh, temperature determinant stuff, 
their chromosomes don't work like that. They don't have like a Y chromosome per se, where it's like those hormones are activated by the temperature. So it's like they, it's not like they're born sexless. So they, they are born with, with, you know, a, you know, male or female anatomy, but yeah. um, I, like I said, I don't, I don't know anything about these particular species, but there are fish that do change sexes as they, you yeah. know, as, as full adults, uh, famously clownfish. So uh, yeah. it's always kind of fun that, you know, Nemo's dad would have turned into his mom. Uh, <laughs> yep. Because I've heard that. Yep. Solitary clownfish will uh, turn from male to female. Yep. So, um, but yeah. And I know crocodilians as well. This is becoming yes. a big problem. Because uh, most crocodilians are also temperature determinant. And so I think if, if it's above a certain temperature, almost all of them will be males, which yep. if you have if you have more males than females, that's a big problem. Yep. Yep. But yeah, uh, that is uh, similar how the southern flounder uh, does that temperature sex dependent determination and uh so i just thought it was a really fun fact that i learned about how two fish species in around where i live can be declining by to- two totally different mechanisms yeah that is uh i mean that's kind of one of those things that i don't think we ever would have it's one of the things that doesn't make the news like it's oh yeah yeah you know mm-hmm. we hear about like jellyfish in australia and like, you know, there's always, every time you look at climate changes, there's always like sad polar bear, you know, swimming for infinity, yep. trying to get to the ice, but spoiler alert, there is no ice, but like, <laughs> the, you know, this is the kind of thing that like you, I wish there was more of, I wish that there was more, I don't know, just more like banal, Hey, these are, these are things that are happening to species on the planet. Yeah. And, and spoilers, basically everything that we don't directly benefit from raising and actively raise is doing bad. <laughs> Spoilers. I wonder if there's any correlation there. Hmm. Weird. <laughs> I mean, correlation is not causation, but that is some damn good correlation. Yeah. Sad. And on that note, <laughs> this has been episode 68 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike. That is Gavin and Fia. And we will see you guys all next week for a very special episode of I Wish You Were Dead. But until then, take care, everybody. <laughs>